Well, good morning. Good morning. I'm glad that you are with us in worship today as we continue in our Lenten series, Creating Me a Clean Heart. Our theme today is on confession and absolution as we reflect on Hebrews chapter 9. Our opening hymn is hymn number 599. Thinking about confession and absolution, um, I thought this would be a great hymn to begin on, hymn 599. If you're able, please rise. Join me in making the sign of the cross as we say together. We are under the care of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray together as the Lord Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We confess together, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the, and the life, life everlasting. everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. While we reflect on today's reading as we're journeying through the New Testament, one chapter a day, five days a week, we... Uh, um, began in the Gospel of Mark, went to the book of Acts, and now we're in the book of Hebrews, and we are at chapter 9 today. Um, and it's going to lead us, I think, 
it will absolutely lead us into um, the topic of confession and absolution. And that's why we chose this portion of the liturgy to focus on today, because we were, um, uh, because it speaks so highly of confession and absolution. But the theme actually began at the end of chapter 8 yesterday, when um, Jesus offers us a new and better covenant uh, with better promises. We were hearing the quote from Jeremiah 31, where God says, "I in this new covenant, I will... Put my laws in their minds. I will write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall know me, all of them. And I will be merciful toward the, their iniquities and remember their sin no more. What a great setup for uh, this conversation about how Jesus offers us a better covenant or a better testament. He first talks about the earthly tent. Uh, earthly uh, tabernacle or temple. Verse Chapter 9, verse 1. Now even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness um, for a tent was prepared. The first section in which were the lampstand and the table and the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. Behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, or sometimes the holy of holies, having a golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a golden urn holding the manna and Aaron's staff, which budded, and the tablets, the two stone tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things, we cannot now speak in detail. These preparations, having thus been made, the priests go regularly into the first section, performing their ritual duties. Now, I should say that the altar was outside, um, not inside the tent, all the smoke and the burning and flames. The, the altar where the sacrifices were offered were there, but in the second section, the lampstand, the table, the bread of his presence, there was work for the priest to do regularly. Uh, and they performed their ritual duties. But into the second, only the high priest goes, and he, but once a year, and not without taking blood, which he offers for himself and for the unintentional sins of the people. By this, the Holy Spirit indicates that the way into the holy place is not yet opened as long as the first section is still found, which is symbolic for the present age. According to this arrangement, this arrangement where the priests go in every day to the first place and the high priest goes in once a year according to this arrangement gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the conscience of the worshiper but deal only with food and drink and various washings regulations for the body imposed until the time of reformation the writer of Hebrews will have more to say about this being made perfect in chapter 10 but obviously, if the priest has to go in every day and the high priest has to go every year, um, it, you need to keep repeating it. It doesn't really work perfectly. Uh, that awaits Christ. And here he then introduces Christ, who will be the perfect sacrifice uh, and offering a better covenant. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, not the tabernacle made by hand by Moses, that is, not of this creation, he entered, Jesus entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, 
thus securing an eternal redemption. For the blood of goats and, and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will it purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he is the mediator, mediator of a new covenant. I, I thought I'd pause, like I did last week, just taking us through the rationale, the, the, the teaching of the writer of Hebrews. And, and just pause here as we're talking about the word covenant. It is variously um, translated in the New Testament as either the word covenant, will, or testament. The word is diatheke, and the preface, the first three letters of diatheke, dia, we, we know that like diameter. It's to go from, from the diameter of a circle all the way through from one side all the way to the other. And so the, the prefix dia always means through or, or thoroughly. And uh, to theme, uh, the root word of theke, uh, means to set. So something is set concretely, thoroughly, completely, all the way through. That's what an agreement, a contract, a covenant is. But this word is also translated equally often as the word will or testament, which is thoroughly written out, completely done, and fully binding. So one has to try and figure out from the context of the statement, are we talking about a contract, a covenant, or a will, last will and testament? I think we're going to see that the best translation of the word coming up is going to be testament or will. This is the same thing. We're familiar with this language. Uh, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup, gave thanks, uh, and gave it to his disciples, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my will. But you could translate the word New Testament, uh, as in last will and testament. Um, we, we have this word in our Bible. We call the two sections of our Bible not the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. We call the two sections the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's the same word. Why is the word last will and testament the better translation now? Well, he's going to tell us. Therefore, he's the mediator of a new testament, a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance, since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. Under the first covenant, a lamb or a bull was killed, and the blood splattered uh, on the altar in places in the holy, and once a year in the holy of holies on the mercy seat at the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, and so they received forgiveness, uh, redeemed from their transgressions under the first covenant. And now he's going to talk about the second covenant. But, but he pauses here to say, for where a will is involved, the death of one who made it must be established. For a will takes effect only at death. Right? Uh, the will is written now. We have our will written but it won't take effect until Nina and I have died. A will takes effect only at death, since it is not in force as long as the one who made it is alive. Therefore, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. For when every commandment of the law had been declared by Moses to all the people, he took the blood of calves and goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the covenant that God commanded for you. 
And in the same way, he sprinkled with the blood both the tent and all the vessels used in worship. Indeed, quoting now, from, uh, or referring to Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11. Indeed, under the law, almost everything is purified <coughs> with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Thus it was necessary for the copies. He'd been talking about worship and earthly worship, a copy of heavenly worship back in chapter 8. It was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified with these rites. But the heavenly things themselves purified with better sacrifices than these. For Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf. Nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with blood not his own. For then he would have had to suffer, then Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And just as it is appointed for man to die once, and after that comes judgment, so Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Our theme for this day is, is found really on the back of our bulletin on this uh, day, uh, March 16th. Our sermon title is Prepared Hearts. Our scripture is Hebrews 9. Our portion of the liturgy is Confession and Absolution. And what we say as a phrase to think about this day, the beginning place for us, and we always begin worship with the confession and absolution, the beginning place for us is grace, not guilt. Why? Because 2,000 years ago, almost, we're getting close to being able to say actually 2,000 years, but 2,000 years ago, Jesus died. And when he died, he offered his life once to bear the sins of many. And when he died, as we hear in, in uh, Ephesians near the end, he put away sin by sacrificing himself. You are forgiven. 2,000 years ago, you on the cross are forgiven. So that Christ having been offered once to bear the sins of many, he has forgiven you. That is a foundational belief of the Christian church. So when we come to confession, we ought always to come thinking of our sins that sent him to the cross. But we cannot come without thinking, primarily, that we are forgiven. He came already verse 28 having been offered once to bear the sins of many now he will come again when at the end of time but but he comes to meet us every day now not to deal with sin because when he looks at us we know that we are forgiven paul says it in romans 8 who will bring a charge against any of god's elect god is the one who justifies who is it who condemns it's not God. It's not Jesus. Christ Jesus has died for our sins. We are forgiven. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Not God. He comes now to us not to deal with sin. He's already dealt with our sin. But he comes to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. I think it's probably true, the saying, that the word of God comes to comfort the afflicted 
and at times afflict the comfortable. There are times where we need to be reminded, Bob, you're a sinner. But more often than not, the truth is, I know that. And I think probably most people know that most of the time. Maybe not everyone. But most people are keenly aware of their falling short. Uh, so there are times when, like King David needed to hear from Nathan the prophet, you are the minute, man, you are the sinner. There are times where that word has to be spoken. But I think 90% of the time, we know that. Uh, when we forget, we can be reminded we're sinners. But probably most of the time, we need to be reminded, you are forgiven. And so he comes the second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. When he comes again, will our hearts be prepared? When we come to him today, as we actually come in the beginning of our regular worship services, our Sunday worship services, we come with prepared hearts, hearts having been forgiven. The beginning place, as we begin and gather for worship, the beginning place is grace. Not a focus on our own guilt, but a focus on his grace. So, uh, at this time, I'm going to invite, um, do you guys have pens? Yes. Okay, because you can maybe, we, we have extra pens back here to, to hand out as well. But Karen and I are going to be um, leading us through our worksheet now, um, where we can, um, and if you need another pen, Nina can grab you one too, but if you're okay, we're good. Uh, Karen's going to lead us through our worksheet to say, how do we try and take this portion of the liturgy and help it become a deeper experience for us. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to we're going to pray. And there's a summary of what we're going to pray about up there, but I'll I'll pray for us. Lord God, um, we're taking this time to ask you to lead us in a direction that will improve this the health of our spiritual heart. We pray that during this um, reflection you will reveal to us an obstacle to remove or something new that you're leading us to add to our christian life in jesus name amen, amen. so number two on our sheet is uh, identify the obstacle um, so uh i'm going to interview pastor bob and uh he'll he will hear what he says and then we'll give you time to reflect and um Maybe write down a few notes for yourself that you can think about uh, during the week and in future worship services. So, during our worship service, uh, we encounter a part of the liturgy called Confession and Absolution. Pastor Bob, what joy do you find in this part of the liturgy? Well, I, I always look forward to hearing the word of grace. That Jesus says, I am forgiven. Um, it feels like a fresh start. Um, so I look forward to that. Okay. And um, uh, what's going on in you during the absolution confession that might be a frustration or a distraction? Flow right through it. You know, just the words that just spew out. I think that could be true of every part of the liturgy. But beyond that, um, Sometimes I find it frustrating, Karen, because I just keep mentioning the same old sins all the time. Um, I, I find that distracting. Um, and then sometimes um, I, I find it distracting that I name these repeated little sins and instead of the bigger battle with sin. And I always like to say the Bible looks at sins and sin. And sins are little things like murder, other horrible things. But the big sin is like unbelief and despair, failure to trust God. Um, and the power of sin that causes me to not want to trust him. 
And, and so when my mind is occupied with those bad habits or words or actions or thoughts, um, it's convenient for me not to be thinking how um, my life is a battle with sin all the time. So that's a distraction. Sometimes my listing of sins distracts me from really the big issue of my life, the brokenness. And um, uh, then probably a whole other part that I find distracting is that I am focusing um, on myself. As opposed to, uh, this is a, a confession I don't do privately, like going to my bishop and making a, a personal private confession, but um, it's, a, it's a confession we do together. Um, and, and when I'm just focused on me, um, I'm, I'm within the community of faith and, and I, I don't always see the community gathered. I, I, I probably rarely do, I'm looking so much at myself. Um, and then when I'm looking at myself and all my sins, I'm not looking at the gospel, uh, the good news of Jesus. So I'm distracted by looking at myself. Probably a long answer, but that's... Well, um, we're gonna work on it. So we, <laughs> we have next uh, a portion on, on the sheet called Describe the Desired Outcome. And the question there is, what would confession and absolutely absolution look like if it was full of joy and without your distractions? Well, I tried thinking about this, of course, ahead of time. Um, yeah, we cheated. <laughs> we cheated, yeah. You guys are hopefully thinking about your own things that are distracting. But but I... Uh, oh, we probably should have given time. I, we didn't oh, pause. We, did. we, we didn't pause. pray. So... so in this first time, before I actually answer that question, Karen can ask me again. Okay. We want to have you take a moment to maybe write down what is your joy in the in that portion of the liturgy, or what do you, in your own experience do you find frustrating or distracting? Right? I won't do that again. Let me do this. In that. But I just remembered. Actually, sorry, folks, for writing. and absolution be like for you if it was full of joy and without distraction? I am um, I think Karen I often with anything I'm doing want to figure out what do I have to get done here and go do that that way so um, I'm immediately my mind goes okay confession and absolution I got to figure out what am I confessing and and if it was a better time for me, um, I'd probably more deeply recognize my own brokenness um, and how I'm part of a community that is broken, worldwide and in, in the congregation. And I'd want to admit um, not just my individual sins, but a, a need I had to call out to God to make give me a clean heart. Um, and that I'd, I'd do something like that, call out to him to give me a clean heart in that time and renew a right spirit in me uh, so I don't have to keep bringing up the same things week after week. Um, and I certainly want always to hear the word of grace that I am forgiven and that I'd, I'd sense somehow that I've been washed. Um, that, would, that would probably be what would make that time more meaningful. 
do you want to think about how maybe confession and absolution is joyful? Yeah, that was my, I guess my answer was pretty much the work I have to do. I didn't answer it anyway about being joyful. How, how could it be more joyful? I, I think that's a really great question for me. Um, because I said one of my distractions is that I'm focusing on me. And I just started focusing on everything I had to do. Um, so if it were more joyful, my attention would be where it belongs, less on me and more on Christ, I think. Um, I think that would help that time be something I'd look for, not just have to do, but I'd look forward to if my focus could be on Jesus. Um, and um, um, that I would confess any recent thing in my mind that b was bothering me. Uh, not that I have to manufacture it, but if there, if there was something that day or some recent event that I needed to let go of and say, God, I need help letting go of this failure, then I would probably uh, simply um, try to recall that that I'm a sinner Christ loves and came to save and die for. Um, and uh, uh, be, get in a place where I can just really focus on him and hear the words, Bob, you are forgiven. That would be really, that would be joyful. So it, it, you can go ahead and take a minute if you could imagine any joy um, without distraction. What would be the perfect time in that liturgy, that portion of liturgy, what would it feel like? Perfect time. Feeling joy, no distraction, what would it look like for you? In Mark um, chapter 12, verse 30, Jesus summarizes all the commands in a simple way. He says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. Pastor, if you were more fully present during the confession and absolution, with your whole body engaged, what would it look like? Start with your heart. Well, I think I think the thing I know about myself that in my heart um, I love Jesus. I love my relationship, my personal life-giving relationship with Him. I love my relationship with Him, experienced with other believers. I love my relationship. I love Jesus, and I love my relationship with Him more than anything in my in my life. And I would just want to always remember that that is the truth about me. There's a little truth that I'm a sinner. It's a big truth. I'm a sinner. But there's a, a bigger truth that I do love Jesus in spite of all my failings. Okay. Um, and we'll move on to your soul, your spirit in relation to God. If I'm thinking about confession and absolution, and I'm thinking about my relationship with God, I would picture myself as a little child who falls down and stumbles and doesn't do things right all the time, but they're growing and they're learning, and I have a Heavenly Father who just loves watching me stumble and get back up because he's embracing. I just I can see myself in my relationship with God as that he loves me, and he is pleased with me, and he's always there to help me. He's in, emboldening me in his arms. Uh, what's going on in your mind, your thoughts and your emotions, if it's the ideal confession and absolution time in that liturgy? What's going on in your mind? Right now, I'm thinking in my mind um, that instead of having a picture of Bob 
and of his frailties, I could look at Jesus and I could I could see him like in our chapel here praying at the Garden of Gethsemane. I could see him in heaven praying for me. Or I think where I, I that'd be a good place to see Jesus. But I think in my mind I could picture him, visualize him on the cross. And the very first thing he says from the cross is he's the nails are pounded in and he's he's set on the, the post and he's hanging there, the very first thing he says is, Father, forgive them. I could picture Jesus forgiving everybody on the cross. And your strength. We're going to think of our strength as our body and all your senses. What's going on with your body and all the senses during that time of of worship? I think if it was working better with my eyes, I wouldn't be just looking at myself. I'd see the congregation, that we're all in the same boat together. And we're all sinners together, and we're all loved, and we're all forgiven together. And um, I would kind of see us coming together in that moment to be with our Lord who is on the cross forgiving us. And I would feel, um, because I get to do this and nobody else really does, some people do it on the way out of church or the way into church. But I, I usually do the confession back by the, by the water, by the baptismal font. And I dip my fingers in the water and then I'll give the, the blessing. And, and I'll, I can mark the sign of the cross. I usually do that on my forehead. I can feel the water and remember that I've been washed clean of my sins. Um, and, and then I think... I'd want to, um, as I hear, but it's not just, I, I, I get to do two things at once. I get to hear the word of absolution, but I'm hearing it as I'm speaking it. Um, so as I'm speaking it, and then hearing it, but as I'm speaking it, I'd like to have a, a smile on my face because I'm like saying to you, mm-hmm. Karen, I have really good news for you. You are forgiven. Instead, I think I do it seriously because it's confession and absolution. And I've missed some of the joy of that moment to say, you're forgiven. And I could just look at people and I could smile and say, hey, I've got some really good news here. You, in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. So I think I want to add a smile. I want to look at people in a different way, see our connectedness. I want to feel the water and the washing. And then I want to smile when I announce the really, really good news. And not be quite so serious, I think. Because mm-hmm. there is joy in it. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so we've done all this. So we've asked all these questions because we want to grow. So we have um, this coming section is called Plan to Grow. And the first thing we're going to do is pray together Psalm 5110. And it's right up here on the corner of your sheet. It's uh, the colorful part. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. And then we ask ourselves, uh, I will ask Pastor Bob, what are a few small yet intentional steps you can take during this worship service and for the services to follow that will help you move in a direction of your desired outcome? Well, I think I was just kind of thinking through some of that when I answered about the, my heart, soul, mind, and strength. I, I think mm-hmm. that idea of picturing in my mind, kind of visualizing, uh, standing before Jesus at the foot of the cross and, look, and, and, and seeing him look at me as he says those words, Father, forgive Bob and forgive all of them. Uh, I, I, I'd want to do that. I think that'd be a good thing for me. I'd like to see. Um, I'd like to see my connectedness to the congregation who's coming with me to that moment, um, and so I, I, I want to somehow maybe visualize at the eleven o'clock service when I walk back to do the confession, to visualize my like gathering the sheep together. We're we're coming to Jesus here at the font. Um, uh, maybe even holding hands, visualizing. I'm not going to hold hands of people coming back, but but that I'm somehow visualizing being connected to people. 
I'd like to, um, I, to make this happen, I'm going to have to remember, and I'm very bad at remembering because I just go through routines. So I'm going to have to write some notes in my bulletin uh, to, to kind of picture Jesus on the cross and, and look at the people and visualize coming with them. And a fourth thing I thought is um, maybe I could do any, because I find my own focus on myself distracting. So maybe at the prelude time or before I even get to worship, maybe in the car coming, I could offer some personal things that I'm struggling with and just offer those to God and know that I'm forgiven. So I'm better prepared to see the joy of the absolution. Um, so those are like four things I was thinking about that I could do. Okay, if you want to take a minute and write a thing or two that you might try to do um, to help you reach your desired outcome. Started. Okay. So, so what's the what's the first, which step do you think you'll take first? Well, I think the clear one for me, because I'm so forgetful, would be to make notes in my bulletin, to write something in my bulletin uh, about picturing standing before Jesus and looking, uh, holding hands with the congregation, somehow gathering us together. And when are you going to start that? I think I'll have to write that down this week um, when I... Uh, I organize the bulletin usually on Saturday. Uh, my, I write notes in the bulletin. And so that's probably, whenever I, I do it, if I did it Friday, fine. But when I do my preparation of the bulletin, I need to add confession and absolution and remember to write a few notes. So the tools you need is just like a pencil? And my bulletin, yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Um, is there anyone you can ask to support you? If I didn't have this piece of paper where I've written my notes, I'd probably need somebody to help remind me. But I think I'm going to keep this right with my Sunday worship stuff so I can remember to, uh, to write those notes in. Okay. And the last few questions. Um, how, will work, how will working to grow by the help of God in this aspect of your worship, the confession and absolution, how will working to grow in this aspect of worship renew you? I think I can come away with a deeper sense of joy as opposed to just a part of the liturgy we got through. That I could really be more prepared, my heart prepared to enter into the joy of listening to the word and worshiping God and singing him by having that clear vision of Jesus and hearing the word of grace. I, I think I'd, I'd have a deeper joy. Okay, next question. Um, how will working um, in this towards your desired outcome improve your relationships? I think smiling at people when I do the absolution might, but, and somehow seeing that it's not just a whole lot of individuals doing this, but that we're together doing this. So that connection with people and smiling would help my connection with other people. And how might uh, trying to grow in this aspect of worship renew your worship? I think I feel, I'm feeling now that that would be very refreshing to do that. So I'm looking forward to trying. Thank you. Thank you for helping me work this. And so this is the kind of thing, when we're thinking about growing as Christians, it's always about being intentional. What are we thinking of doing and then trying to do it? And so we offer these worksheets as a way to help all the different parts of liturgy be somewhat more impactful for us um, and um, I guess I, I thought we would take a moment today to turn in the hymnal to the front of our hymnal uh, to page 94 the small number at the bottom of the page near the front of the hymnal because it seems to me um, as as Karen and I were going through this yesterday that um, on Sunday morning, we have a confession, but not usually at the Wednesday services. But it would be a really good uh, opportunity for us 
to do the confession. Um, uh, and there's two versions here, one on the left, one on the right. I'll just choose to do the one on the right. Um, and so the bottom of page uh, 94 begins, of course, where there's bold print, that's things we do together. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who forgives all our sins and whose mercy endures forever. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And I'm going to be thinking about Christ on the cross looking down at me as I do this. I don't know what you guys will be doing, but but I want to picture him telling me I'm forgiven. And then together we make our confession. Gracious God, have, have mercy, mercy on, on us. us. We, we confess, confess that we, we have turned, turned from you and, and given ourselves into the power of sin. sin. We, we are, are truly sorry and humbly repent. repent. In, In your, your compassion, compassion forgive us our sins, sins knowing and, and unknown. Things, things we have, have done, done and things, things we have failed, failed to do. Turn us again to you, you and uphold us by your spirit, so that, that we may live and serve, and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, Christ our Savior and Lord. Lord. Amen. Amen. And then uh, I turn the page to the absolution again. I'll choose the one on the right. God, who is rich, and, and here's where I want to be thinking, I've got some good news to share. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. Amen. Now we'll join in singing, and you can remain seated, for our hymn of the day, uh, hymn number 323, um, uh, a Lenten verse, but, uh, Lenten hymn, but about the love and the forgiveness of God. I thought I first picked a, a, a really penitential song, and as we were preparing, I thought, oh, I'm getting way too serious. I forgot about the joy and the love of God, and so uh, we'll sing... Uh, a song based on John 3.16, God Loved the World.
my prayers that I was wanting to pray for some people who had called in for special prayer requests and I'm going to forget some of them and uh, I think we'll get that in just we'll do it just a moment oh I have the offertory prayer well Lord here's a picture of you hanging on the cross uh, right before us in this uh, altarpiece Lord we thank you for the gift of your offering for our sins and we pray father that that you would receive these offerings as a token of our thanks to you for your great love and forgiveness and we pray lord that these offerings may you be used to bless the proclamation of the absolution the good news that in christ we are forgiven and this message go out to the world in jesus name we pray amen responsive prayers um, so join me after during your um, words in bold print show us your mercy O God and, and grant, grant us your, your salvation. salvation give us the joy of your saving help again and, and sustain, sustain us with your bountiful, bountiful spirit. spirit give peace in all the world for only, only in you, you can, can we live, live in safety. Keep the nations under your care. And, and guide, guide us, us in the way of justice, justice and truth. truth. Let your way be known upon the earth. Your For saving health, health among, among all nations. nations. Let not the needy be forgotten. Nor, nor the hope of the, the, the poor, poor be taken, taken away. away. Lord, this week we've been asked to pray for healing for Georgian, Tyler, Brittany, and Susan, Pastor Ray, and Wayne, who's been placed on comfort care, for Chris, who's gone into the hospital with illness and some heart issues, and for Mary, who's had a heart attack. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and sustain, sustain me with, with your, your Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Lord, hear our prayer, and hear let our, our cry come, come before, before you. you. Amen. Amen. Our closing prayer is a prayer during the response to prayer service that we have here that uh, reminds us of Christ hanging on the cross at noon. So I think we can join in praying this together. Gracious Jesus, our Lord and our God, at this hour you bore our sins in your own body on the tree so that we being dead to sin might live unto righteousness have mercy upon us now and at the hour of our death and grant to us your service with all others who devoutly remember your blessed passion a holy and peaceful light in this world and through your grace eternal glory in the light to come where with the father and the holy spirit you live and reign, God, forever. Amen. And receive the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen.